Hello, every folks, and good morning. Welcome to another edition of Know Your Unit. Uh, so today will be about the shaman, but I wanted to go ahead and start this off by kind of addressing mechanics a little bit here. Um, because, you know, like everything else, uh, there's a lot of uh, things kind of flying left, right, and center uh, when it comes to Tactics Ogre. And in particular, uh, there's kind of a unique situation with the uh, shaman there, uh, in which they're actually a bit of a paradox in the series of a class that's actually overestimated more than it's underestimated. So I wanted to go ahead and cover some of that context about them, explain the actual strengths of the class, as well as addressing some of their weaknesses, and then uh, kind of uh, show how to use them, how to understand them, and and what they're good for. So, uh, let's go ahead and start this off with a little context here. Uh, why am I showing this off with uh, with archers here? Well, because for the purposes of today's episode, um, it has to be understood that there's only six shamans available in the entire game, meaning that our usual test map will not be working particularly well. Uh, so, for the sake of an example, I had you know I had a comparison here of uh, four archers essentially doing about as well as those six shamans are going to do. Just to give you an idea of basically any class will essentially end up getting curb stomped in the scenario on account of, you know, there only being uh, six of them um, and the fact that they're kind of mandatory, mandatorily coming in with green and blue equipment in this uh, particular example. But uh, just so you know, uh, this is partially to highlight uh, that it isn't exclusively just a numbers thing when it comes to them. Uh, when it comes to the shamans in particular, they are very, very squishy. Um, Again, obviously by design, they are essentially a min-maxed uh, caster kind of class, but uh, they're also one that has a lot of requirements to them. Uh, almost, I mean, almost comically so in some cases, but this is again why I wanted to show this as an example, because technically speaking, most other classes will have the option to pivot in some way to deal with a numbers disadvantage. In their case, they have only one direct purpose, which is more or less a magical howitzer. Um, they're there uh, for the purpose of being artillery, and they will not necessarily be able to uh, kind of out damage an entire map by themselves without some support. Because again, part of the reason for those support abilities, secondary abilities, all that kind of thing with other classes is going to be those cases where you need to overcome a, a disadvantage of some description. So for example, like right here, uh, we've got just four rando archers with charm bows, and again, that is, they're essentially overcoming their disadvantage in numbers by the fact that they're mind controlling the enemy uh, team to their side. Or let's say, for example, you have something like a, um, uh, like a fencer or whatever, maybe coming in with poison spears, same thing with a dragoon. Um, basically, all of these are more or less non-numerical force multiplier in a way. Um, so, now that uh, we've kind of shown what can happen, let's go ahead and come in with the star of the show here today, and that is going to be the shamans. Uh, so, like I said, uh, their purpose is that of uh, magical artillery here. Um, there's only six of them available, and one thing to actually bear in mind here is that this, uh, this class actually does have a lot of interesting quirks to it. Uh, so the main four sisters are going to be locked into their token elements, however the two other shamans, uh, namely Yuria and Deneb, can come in as any element. Um, this is particularly notable, because if you turn either of them into divine through one means or another and turn them into a shaman, you can create the most useless caster in the game because they can't even fill out an entire spell list with the stuff that they're effective against. So, before we even get into that, let's talk about uh, casters and how exactly they can be made, you know, quote-unquote, effective here. So, essentially, when it comes to spells, they kind of work opposite to physical attacks. Namely, with physical attacks, if you match your weapon's element, you're going to be getting about 10% uh, uh, extra in terms of your damage, and then if you're hitting on a weakness, uh, you're going to be getting another 30%. Uh, uh, in the case of, like, let's say the weapon is strong against that person's weakness, it'll use either 30% or uh, what the, uh, the weapon is carrying, whichever happens to be stronger. Um, in the case of magic, though, it's the other way around. Namely, they get their 30% bonus up front, uh, gaining more raw power, but then only gaining 10% if they were to attack on a weakness, meaning that they're focusing far more on the neutral, more so than the effective. Uh, this is why, for example, if we go over here to their uh, uh, their maximum number score, um, I, when it comes to the kind of uh, shown attack value here, just so you know, this is more or less a, like, if absolutely nothing else were to be, to be applying, this would basically be their max damage kind of a situation in a neutral scenario where no other modifiers are acting on it. So 
As a bit of a refresher, magic is generally going to be the most stable, it's going to be the lowest, but um, they generally overcome this by attacking more targets or attacking more times. Uh, magic is gen or uh, sorry, melee is generally going to be the one that's kind of in the middle, and then ranged is going to be the one that's got the highest highs and lowest lows. So, uh, when it comes to to your shamans here, uh, their actual skill list is going to be one of the more modest ones in the game. Um, a bit like a... Well, there's oftentimes a comparison made between the Shaman and the Archer, and that's not for no reason. They both have very similar uh, loadouts in terms of their weapons, and in terms of, well, limitations of weapons, um, and both are functionally speaking just doubling down on the idea of attacking more times. So, for uh, for the Shaman here, we've got uh, Hammers, uh, this is exclusively going to be for the Chaldea. Uh, we've got Cudgels, and then we've got Spellbooks. Uh, unlike many of the other casters, they do not have access to Daggers. Um, which doesn't exactly mean that much, since most of the time this is going to be in your offhand. Uh, daggers in particular are just handy because of the sticker, uh, due to a bit of a thing that you can do, uh, wherein the sticker is actually uh, going to be a quarter of the weight of the Chaldea, while also essentially allowing you to switch your armor to a piercing variant. Uh, under certain circumstances, this can be potentially uh, interesting as far as your armor goes. We'll be showing off more of that later. But uh, for the time being, uh, it's kind of going to go ahead and be assumed that uh, they're going to be going for uh, crushing uh, type defenses whenever possible, uh, just due to the fact that they're going to be running a staff in their main hand uh, for range. Um, again, as far as cudgels go, it's exactly what you'd expect. Uh, essentially, they got sticks. The sticks will do the range thing. The uh, Caldia will be there as their parry option. Um, and then if you want to run spell books, it's going to be kind of right there in the middle. Uh, you're going to be limited to plus three range, but potentially that 15% uh, plus 10% uh, bonus off of the uh, uh, off of the hit might be helpful in some very specific cases. Like, for example, something like the uh, Biblion Teratos, uh, essentially giving you 25% bonus physical damage if attacking a something like a griffin. Um, now, the reason I'm going to bring up a couple of things here when it comes to, like, for example, that book in particular, um, as well as always carrying the hammer finisher, is because of, well, their main role and their main weakness. As I mentioned earlier, their main role is going to be as magical artillery. They're going to be wanting to go for long range and high power as much as possible. Now... This is, again, partially due to the fact that they don't have any defensive options for them, but also uh, due to the fact uh, that they're going to have pretty significantly long range. So, in terms of their actual unique functions, there's little that this class can do that others can't, but they are running a very specific combination of certain things. Namely, that they're going to be matching their own favored elements, uh, combining that with Nature's Touch, combining that with Engulf, combining that with Meditate, combining that with Cudgel Access. Uh, while many other classes will have specific access to, uh, you know, kind of some or more of those things, um, generally speaking, they're the ones that are going to have all of it at once. Now, how much this actually benefits you is going to depend entirely on what you're looking for, because again, raw damage is entirely their whole thing. They get no access to debuffs aside from the charm effect on the Caldia. Uh, possibly some, I believe they could get Paralytic Wave off of one type of gloves. Um, but again, we're talking primarily, like, really, really limited access in terms of anything other than damage. Um, in terms of uh, having coverage for their weaknesses, they're going to have access to those finishers, which again, you know, they're already using that for, for their spells, so that's fine. Um, but generally speaking, I would recommend running the, uh, the Caldia because one of their big weaknesses, being a back row artillery class, is going to be versus uh, versus flyers. Now, typically, these are going to be griffins and cockatrices, which are primarily going to be coming in with an air element. Uh, this means that something like a tyrant's mace could give them a very nice punish if they were to get rushed down. So, in terms of the class itself, uh, this is a class that's going to be unique. It's unique to several of the fastest characters in the game already. So, while the class itself generally has speed that's roughly on par with uh, most of the other casters, it's slightly faster, but not by much. Uh, most of the characters themselves are going to, um, to once again, be giving them that speed bonus. This is partially why I mentioned that the context around these guys is kind of interesting, because oftentimes it's the class that's praised, um, despite the fact that the class itself is overwhelmingly basic. Um, anyway, uh, the reason that I compare this is because, again, like looking at their, uh, uh, looking at their skill list here, if we were to go down the list, pretty much every caster has access to engulf. Uh, you've got multiple of the endgame casters that are going to be running nature's power or nature's touch. Sorry, uh, this actually used to be unique to them back in the PSP version. Uh, this just sort of got spread around this time uh, this time around. Uh, namely, uh, uh, like liches and Valkyries get them, who are going to be pretty much uh, 
their peers or better in most cases. Um, concentration is a bit of an odd one for them because they'll pretty much never have the option to actually miss with their spells. Uh, so this is a very odd one. Um, in terms of resonance, uh, this is actually an interesting interaction that uh, they exclusively can do, and this is what, the only reason I'm bringing it up, because it's a little bit niche, um, but they can actually boost their allies in, in one element while protecting themselves with a different one. Namely, you can use your personal instill as a shield while using your resonance for your offense. This does mean your shield will randomly turn off, but it is potentially an interesting little... Uh, you know, little thing to potentially consider. Like, let's say you have multiple melee units that are, you know, running wind for whatever reason, and you want to protect yourself against ice, you would essentially be able to use a something like a Resonate Air in order, or sorry, a Aerial Resonance in order to boost them while then putting on your ice shield for yourself. So that would be handy as far as that goes. Uh, all right, uh, let's keep going here. Again, to compare, pretty much every caster will have access to Meditate. Uh, in terms of Nature's Whisper, uh, this is unique to them. Uh, it gives a, lo a kind of readout. Um, I was going to say a printout. For some reason, that came out as loadout. I apologize. Um, but this is going to give you a uh, kind of a numerical uh, printout over the state of the elements on the field. Uh, this basically means that uh, you're getting your prevailing element score. Um, to give you a, an idea, this is a score that'll go from 0 to 100. Uh, in the case of an element being already strong, like for example in your uh, elemental temples and things, it is going to start off at 20. The way this works is if you keep casting a particular spell uh, or you keep using a particular element uh, more than anything else, it will raise the maximum power of that element while lowering the uh, maximum power of its opposing element. This sounds really cool, but it is very niche and rarely ever comes up, but this is a nice way to kind of test it to see how you want to potentially employ that into your team. Is it realistically something that's going to come up that often? That's going to be a no, Chief. I'm sorry, but it's still fun to play around with. <laughs> anyway, um, so... Let's talk about some builds here. So, due to the fact that they are, you know, long-range artillery, you want to be going for damage by some means or another. But, while it is tempting to simply stack intelligence, I want to make another quick point here on growths. Uh, because this will endlessly... I, I, this has come up in the comments so many times, it's, uh... uh it, it, it's almost, uh, kind of joke-worthy at this point. But, okay, look. With the shamans, the whole growth thing... It has to be understood that stats are something that's available for free in the end game. That's kind of just at a base level, you can keep doing stats as much as you want. Getting even if it's like 30 extra intelligence is nothing in the post game. It, like, consider this in terms of percentages, right? So these three right here are three units that are absolutely at their baseline, okay? So I had Sistina come in here. Uh, she was She's going to be the one with the most play in terms of growths. She came in at level 16, she trained her whole... Actually, no, she trained, uh, I think it was like five levels as a shaman, and then the rest of her levels were entirely knight, right? Um, we had Saria, who came in, uh, she's trained her, uh, her whole career as a shaman since getting recruited, and then we have Deneb, who has trained her whole career as a witch, and then changed into a shaman. And I'm talking basic witch, not the witcha. Um, okay, so, this can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different cases, but... Um, for example, by that logic, by, you know, the growth chart and things like that, this should mean, in, you know, in most folks' opinion, that Saria, having trained her whole career there as a shaman, should have the highest intelligence. She's got intelligence gear, she's got all this other stuff. Uh, just to point this out here, by the way, she's got a ring of the mind, sure, um, but this is primarily just to, uh, I like using that Caldia for the charm effect, just to point this out, the actual difference between a ring of intellect and a ring of mind is not really that significant. Like, I, I always see the Ring of Intellect get put on. The Ring of Mind will give you better defenses, and considering that magic has a lower maximum, having that better magic defense is generally going to matter a lot more than four damage. Uh, anyway, uh, they both give very comparable bonuses is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, but the Ring of Mind is going to give you far more in terms of defense. Anyway, so between the two of them, again, you can see that the stats are not too dissimilar on the actual stats side. You've got four extra points on strength for Sestina. Uh, uh, again, Sestina was the one that was training as a knight. Saria was the one that was training as a shaman. Vitality-wise, you get one extra point on Sestina. For dexterity, you get one extra point on Sestina. Agility-wise, two extra points on Sestina. Avoidance, uh, you get uh, an extra five on, uh, on Saria here. Um, for intelligence, there's three less on Saria. Uh, for mind, uh, there's going to be seven more on Saria. And for resistance, it's going to be two more on Saria. Again, 
the numbers are barely different. Why is this? Because as far as all those growths are, that's all well and good, but it's far from the whole story. Again, these guys have not had any charms put on them or any of that, and they obviously they will have their own general kind of tendencies based on the unit in question, but your randos, not not only your randos, but your uniques will also be rolling unique stats. Uh, every time that you re-recruit a unit, they will have different stats. Um, and this essentially means that in some cases you can wind up with dramatically better or worse units. And I think that's where a lot of the misunderstanding comes from like, oh crap, their intelligence mind was through the roof, they broke everything. You, In order to make up for... Like, again, each point is roughly two points of damage. In order for that to stack up, you need like a lot for it to stack up. Again, that maximum number there on the top right, like let's say 635 here, 651 in Deneb's case, if she hits all seven of her summons, again, that's going to be like 140 extra damage in total for a summon under the ideal circumstances. It's not going to be a massive deal. I know it feels like I'm harping on about this, but this comes up a lot where folks get very, very passionate about those growths. <laughs> And I hear you, I get it, it's an RPG, we like to focus on the numbers, but there's a lot more intangible stuff going on here. So, anyway, with uh, with all of that said, growths are all well and good, but I want you to pay attention to another number here. Because you may notice, again, one thing that, uh, that Sestina does have that everybody else does not, is health. Because that's one of those bars that the actual growths are going to matter a hell of a lot more than everything else. Why? Because their weakness isn't a lack of raw power. Most casters are barely resisted by anything, so raising that maximum number is going to have very diminishing returns right from the get-go. Uh, essentially, they're doing fine right out, of the, right out of the gate. The spells themselves do the jobs just fine. Um, again, remember, it is not the class that determines how much, a, uh, how much damage a move will do. It's going to essentially be a mix of their stats and then the ability's actual attack score that's inbuilt. Um, while you do have a small bonus from the class itself, this is usually just for physical stuff and usually is not going to be that significant. We're talking like 10 or so. I think on the highest end, it was like 30 for some monster units. Um, but again, it's not going to actually be significant in this case. The class itself is simply a chassis to build all the stuff on top of. So what actually matters is what they can equip over here and what can they what they can equip over here. The class determines the squares that you've got on hand. So with that all being said, again, all of their spells are going to already be doing the work for them. They don't necessarily need to be focusing on that, but if they can focus on taking that extra hit, overcoming their main weakness of getting completely eaten by birds, again, birds eat wizards, it's it's a thing. <laughs> if they can overcome their primary weakness, that's going to help them out a lot. Um, so yeah, as you can tell, roughly two to 300 health over their peers, uh, especially for Deneb, who rolled uh, low health and high intelligence, apparently. Um, but again, these are all going to be minor differences. It's kind of the tools at hand that are going to make far more of a difference. Because let me ask you, let's say they get like 50 extra intelligence. We're talking like you've gone and grinded them up. You've gone and, you know, given them a bunch of, uh, bunch of relic gear and whatever else and like giving them the fire crest and whatever else. They've gotten that 50 extra intelligence. How much is that? Extra hundred damage, right? You've spent like, what, 20 plus hours, whatever, getting those stats up, right? That's going to show up, you're going to feel it, it's going to be tangible, all well and good. Now, what if instead you could equip two pieces of, of uh, luck equipment, and they just simply double their damage instead? It's going to give you far bigger returns. And, kind of right from the get-go here, uh, one thing to actually consider about this is like, for example, look, you take off a ring of intellect, right? It's removing 15 damage at the cost of essentially combining with this dress here to immediately give them somewhere in the ballpark of like 35% chance to just double their damage outright. So essentially now we have a, as I would argue, far more optimized shaman where they've gone and they've overcome their primary weakness of having a lack of uh, a lack of any defense uh, when it comes to their uh, uh, their actual problem up there, uh, their health bar being non-existent. So they will be able to take an extra hit that'll help them out tremendously. Uh, we see that uh, they're able to uh, uh, to potentially double up on their damage. This is especially handy if you were to equip multiple pieces of the alluring set. Uh, currently, due to a lot of situations, it's in a bit of a short supply, so I've kind of just spread it out among the team here. But for example, if we were to go ahead and swap her over to, let's say, some greasy boots or something like that, um, 
Ah, we can go trousers on her. Why not? Um, then potentially we could have a very, very lucky caster that might be able to do a lot of good things right off the bat. But one of the important things to remember about your artillery is the shells that you load into it. So let's cover another thing, because again, the immediate thought is summons. The summons, they do, you know, they will hit multiple times. But what if I were to tell you that there's a more efficient way to do this? Um, because here, look, I get it. They feel good. You're essentially taking your basic missile abilities. Like, actually, this is a fun little uh, note here. Deadshot 1, 15. Uh, what's a uh, self-fied uh, 1? Essentially attacking 3 with a chance of 4, but you're paying for the cost of 3 basic missile abilities. But look at this interesting little uh, way that these spells actually go, right? Because as the Deadshot goes up, it gets more efficient. Deadshot 2, roughly speaking, is going to be, you know, about double as powerful as the first one, but the, its cost has gone down by 5 with every new iteration. While, uh, while 1 is 15, it goes down to 25 uh, for 2, and then 35 for 3, and then suddenly goes up to 45 for 4 essentially going and taking that damage and stacking it up and up and up and up. But then uh, the summons come in, they're like, what if we just kind of threw that efficiency out the window and start just chucking, you know, fireballs at something? Then that's basically exactly what they're doing. But they can't necessarily control where they're firing, so that's why they're kind of in their big splash area, limited to their uh, big AoE areas. But let's consider the actual kind of efficiency situation of these different paths that these different spells go down. Because there's more to it, than what uh, what first may meet the eye. So, in terms of your overheads, again, it's going to be a similar situation to how we later compare this to uh, stuff like your uh, uh, your apocryphas, uh, where essentially they're going to be taking a fairly economic approach. Uh, only twenty five for your first day, uh, overhead, going up to uh, forty five for your second, uh, fifty uh, for your third, and then going up to uh, uh, going up to seventy for your fourth. Meaning that that third one is going to be noticeably kind of more efficient uh, than your second one. Uh, just kind of something to bear in mind. But what I like to consider for building these teams is what I like to call the uh, 2468 rule. Generally speaking, uh, this is something that I wouldn't advise. Because even if you're looking to have multiple kind of powerful moves available, I would usually recommend only picking one. You want to have something cheap that they can throw out right away, something in the roughly like 1 to 25 range. You want something roughly in the 40s for your mid range. Now, in the case of running an instill like this one, you know, maybe just kind of have a cheap one and then hop up, hop up to about the 50s. And then you keep your big hitter up there at the very end. Now, why would you do this? This is because it's one of those ways that you can get around the fact that uh, battery sticks, as nice as they are, are going to be an inefficient use of time. Which, I, again, I know it seems weird to uh, to bring this up, but think about it. They roll meditate once, and they simply only spend half of it in order to use a dead shot too. This means that they're already guaranteed to have a second attack available for the next round, but if it rolls again, they can immediately move on to their heavy hitters. They can immediately move on to the highest tier thing. But if then it decides not to roll after that, these will still have something to fall back on. And this is especially handy uh, for stuff like their basic missile abilities, which will allow them to completely fall back on something that they'll pretty much never be able to be drained out of. And additionally, this is why we want to try to keep uh, extra options on them whenever possible. Um, like one of those things that I've brought up uh, over and over again is stuff like the Staff of Purification here, giving them an action that they can take without spending any MP. This is essentially the same thing as going and charging up your battery stick, but you're using Meditate to do it instead and taking another action at the same time. Um, it's just something that allows them to essentially go in and kind of continue functioning, continue acting, doing something other than kind of sitting there and, you know, eating the battery stick, as it were. I don't know why I always just get the image in my head of them just, like, sitting there and just, like, gnawing on the stick like it's a piece of jerky. <laughs> like, I need my magic juice. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Uh, but, anyway. So, yeah. As, as far as shamans go, again, the reason that I wanted to bring up that stuff earlier is just to show off the fact that, uh, obviously, when they're going in for their test map here, it's not going to be that uh, that crazy of a showing here just due to the fact that obviously they're uh, they're going to have a bit of difficulties on the whole not getting completely slapped around thing um so yeah they will they will come off with a good alpha strike potential and uh that'll be kind of it from there um 
one I think I mentioned this earlier, but again, it's particularly funny if you were to take one of the uh, side shamans and turn them into a divine element, just due to the fact that you can't actually use your entire uh, entire list of uh, different uh, different spells there. Um, so you may notice I didn't uh, cover those draconics earlier, and that's because we're going to talk about them now, because hopefully they'll get a chance to show them off, because the shaman is actually the best draconic user, uh, interestingly enough. Now, yes, draconics themselves are not terribly impressive, but that kind of loading up your spells thing that I was talking about earlier is what we're going to be talking about right now, namely the fact that it kind of branches off. See, at, on the low end, all of your basic spells are entirely about efficiency. They're trying to get more and more power out of comparatively less MP, technically speaking, and, you know, they can keep scaling it up, but they will still have a way to scale down to something cheaper. That being said, Draconics essentially kind of branch off in one direction, where they're like, okay, we're just going to get a bit more expensive, but we're only getting slightly more powerful, but we're also giving you more range. And then on the other end, you've got your Apocrypha, which basically said, okay, screw it, sacrifice the range, we're going down on that. Um, we're going to have the range, uh, we're going down from uh, from 5 down to 3, or in the case of Draconics, going down from 6 down to 3, but we're going to give you dramatically more power. So, like, uh, generally speaking, um, your, uh, well, not even generally speaking, it's the only way of speaking for this one, um, your Apocryphas are going to be the most powerful AoE, and uh, as strange as this sounds, they're going to, generally speaking, in terms of your big splash hits, they're actually going to be a lot more efficient than your summons. But how can this be, right? Um, how exactly would that work? Why is it that these uh, that these splashes would do more? Because that's what I mentioned earlier about those summons. Because the summon thing is essentially taking the idea of those missile spells and changing it into throw efficiency out the window. We're going to just completely burst down this one guy. Which works if there's a kind of big open area and if you have something that is not terribly resistant. But again, it is still essentially functioning as those basic missile abilities, uh, meaning that it's going to have a lot of those same limitations. Namely, it's not going to have a very high uh, maximum hit per shot, uh, depending on the circumstance. Obviously, you can make this go crazy with stuff like crits. Uh, simply uh, uh, collect a couple of magic cards, collect a couple of crit cards, and you're good to go. But this is where those splashes become even more efficient. I know it seems like I'm circling around a lot here, but think about it. You have something like a Firestorm, right? And what does Firestorm do to the grass? It breaks it. What does grass do when it breaks? It spawns cards, which means that you can essentially use your splashes to turn into those bigger hits while still saving MP for them in the meantime. Just kind of something to consider there. Um, and especially for AI teams, it's worth considering that leaving summons on them all the time will cause them to constantly go for overkills rather than going for something efficient. Um, and especially if you're going for um, uh, for Draconics here, like you'll notice, you know, she's going for a Thunderbird, which, okay, it did 900 on that one guy. But there's something to be said about the chaos of doing, for example, 1500, but in a large area. Because it's not, again, healing can go in one direction. Like you saw right there, she essentially did that same amount of damage, but spread out among multiple units for the same price. Why would that be better? Well, obviously it all is going to depend. Um, in the case of, um, like, in, again, in the case of summons, and especially summons 2, they're all about going for bursts. If you can't get the kill, there is no point. Because in many cases around this point in the game, a lot of things will be carrying around salves, and one unit can be healed for a lot of health. But several units cannot be healed for a lot of health at once, and the AI in particular will refuse to heal any units above 70%. This means that if you've ever had those moments where you thought, wow, it's really weird how these four basic rando casters that I was testing managed to completely outperform these, uh, you know, this team of shamans here, it's not because of direct power. What's interesting is that a lot of the other casters, especially when, uh, when used in an AI role, will tend to essentially accidentally be a lot more efficient in their movement. So basically, by spreading that damage around the entire team, but still doing just enough to actually finish them off, they can as they can effectively do a lot more power than, for example, several of several summon twos coming in at the same time. This is another reason that I mention um, I mentioned something along the lines of those uh, like those Valkyries being a direct competitor to them, because they can essentially take better advantage of these kind of situations where there's a big open like field or something like that without having that limitation of needing to wait for kind of more efficient timing as it were. Um, so for example, like right here, you notice with these shamans, they're constantly overkilling stuff, but all of that overkill isn't necessarily getting them very much. Um, all of that overkill looks very impressive and it feels very good for being a fireworks show, 
But at the same time, those big AoEs are once again spreading out that damage in a larger area, doing a lot more to multiple units, and essentially will be making better use of the MP that they have on hand. It's kind of overcoming their weaknesses a little bit better, if that makes sense. Um, and in fact, in many cases, I've, like I know personally, I've started running Summon 1s far more often than Summon 2s, especially for something like Shamans, simply because the uh, they're far more efficient in terms of their actual cost. Um, for 70 MP, um, usually, what, again, if, if they can't outright kill something, um, they, they're they essentially going to have a much harder time. And trying to go for brute force doesn't, like, it doesn't not work, right? But at the same time, there's just really something to be said about the fact that you could potentially be doing that a lot better in other ways. Usually, if a summon one can't do it, um, usually the summon two will not always be able to do it either. Um, so for example, like a summon one with a crit and a magic card will more often than not be enough to kill off most units because how much do they actually have? Because at that point you could potentially scale up their damage to, you know, 500, 500, 500, 500, 500, you know, that kind of thing. And at that point, yeah, that's going to be more than enough to do it. But then the summon two, it's going to be a whole lot of hits and it's going to feel really cool, but like, at a certain point, you know, it's just kind of burning a lot of stuff that could potentially be spread to other areas, if that makes sense. Also, I'm going to go ahead and retreat right here before we end up uh, losing uh, Saria over there. I think you get the general idea, because <laughs> we're about to lose one more. And then, uh, yeah, it kind of looks like we're about to lose two more, at which point those might get overwhelmed. They might potentially have enough to pull this off, but I don't really feel like uh, going back there. But let's go ahead and show the... Uh, uh, the bar over here on the right where you can see prevailing element throughout that entire fight essentially went up to 36% in favor of wind here. Um, essentially, this will always end up gravitating towards the positive. Uh, so even if two elements are fighting each other, they will just both end up in the blue. Usually, you won't notice this too much. There's some very niche cases where it'll matter. Um, like, for example, um, you will you may notice uh, there's times in Palace of the Dead where your divine stuff just straight up stops working because of how much Word of Pain spam is going on. Um, there's stuff like that, but again, it's usually going to be in more specific cases. But okay. <sighs> so that all being said, um, how exactly do you even get these guys? And um, for that matter... In terms of actually, in terms of the time invested compared with their peers, how do they actually perform? Well, they do hit hard. They're, what's interesting about them is that they're a solid kind of entry level summoner unit. Um, I mean, they're kind of like a basic elemental spammer kind of situation, but the reason I call them entry level is because they're very simple to understand. Uh, it's simply, you give them the spells, they go and they put the thing that gives them extra power, and then they hit stuff. In the normal game, na namely chapters 1 to 4, they don't even get access to uh, nature's power, which means that they are simply the one that can use Apocrypha, which means that essentially they can bar dump something at long range for slightly more power. Truth be told, um, like, if, if anyone was around uh, during uh, kind of those early release days, this is why I kept asking people what the hell happened to the Shaman. Because Nature's Power, their signature ability, is A, not even unique to them anymore, but B, it's available only in the post-game at this point. Uh, which means that, uh, like, even unlike uh, generics, who you can potentially break the level caps with, unique characters don't have that benefit. Um, and you can basically use a recruit to break the level cap, if you didn't know. Um... But yeah, since they're unique, uh, they can't take advantage of a lot of the stuff that other generics can. So, for example, something like a generic Lich could take advantage of the Ogre Blade trick. Okay, so, let's get to it here. So, for when you get summoners, or sorry, for when you get shamans, uh, they're pretty good. Um, again, kind of in chapter 4 there, uh, it is a little bit of a ways to get them. For the sake of context, I only bring this up because I personally find it hilarious, but it is, roughly speaking, uh, depending on how many of them you want to count, going to be 47 maps uh, uh, worth of uh, side quests to unlock the shamans. Now, realistically, you should be doing those in order to get your crafting books anyway, but I find this particularly funny because the actual speedrun of the game is 62 maps long. Um, now... Look, the, the reason that I bring this up is just largely because of the amount of requirements, you know, for these classes, that they got to be a, on a unique unit, so they have to go through a lot of effort to get them. Um, again, there's uh, six bosses uh, between you and the class. 
Um, and on top of that, uh, essentially their main takeaways from all of it are going to be Apocrypha, which is roughly speaking, I think the exact number was like 10 or 20 attack higher uh, than your uh, than your basic elemental variants. Um, which, again, they are... It isn't unique to them. Uh, the Lich... I know I had a Lich long before I had a Shaman. Um, uh, Lich can do that uh, sooner. I uh, can do that for functionally free. In their particular case, again, really long side quests. Have to be on unique characters. You have to specifically unlock the class. In order to get their summons, you still have to go through Palace of the Dead, which is pretty much going to be another dozen maps on top of that pile. So at that point, you've already done almost an entire game's worth of... Uh, of different maps in order to get these guys going, and the reason, again, that I bring this up is to compare with their peers, because what are they getting for all of it? Roughly 10-20-ish percent better maximum power, and they have nothing else to combine it with. Which, again, if that's all you need, that'll do the job just fine. Uh, they're solid as an entry-level thing, they basically optimize themselves by having no other skills on hand. Um, and, you know, on top of that, again, they, they can do the whole double instill thing, which is kind of neat. Um, but aside from that, I know personally at this point, uh, usually I try just to talk about this class, but I know personally at this point, uh, I've, like, I've generally been running any one of the, uh, any one of the sisters or everybody else as, uh, as pretty much anything other than the shaman. Reason for this is if you're looking for an effective summoner, if you're looking to keep the power but would like to have more defensive options, you can go for something like a Rune Fencer or Valkyrie. Um, again, just due to the fact that it is still the same unit, still running the same stats. Um, the actual change in equipment is not going to be that severe. Again, it seems like you're going to be losing a lot by getting rid of that casting equipment, but they're going to be able to last a lot longer on account of not having to worry about those cases where, like, let's say they've got all of their different options, uh, uh, different defense. De de uh, sorry, I apologize. I got a little bit tongue tied there, but uh, where they don't have to worry about their defenses as much. So instead of you know coming and getting double pecked by a bird and that's the end of the story, instead they're comfortably sitting on the front line, you know, parrying things using the free moves available from uh, all their new weapon options and stuff like that, in order to instead, for example, have the option to. Uh, uh, to fully uh, uh, to fully defend themselves against different things, to use all of those summon twos for free instead of having to worry about conserving their MP or recharging themselves, or if they want to go for the raw power approach, again, the Lich with Salvation, if they're nearby something like a Knight or whatever, they have functionally infinite MP at that point, uh, essentially still going to be uh, running those uh, same really strong summons at the same range. Um, in their case, again, because they usually the limitation that's brought up is the fact that uh, they're they're going to be potentially either losing um, kind of losing either salvation or nature's touch i know personally i would prefer salvation between the two uh, because a lack of mp means no damage whereas a lack of nature's touch means less, less damage and, or in the case of your basic casters even uh, you may have noticed that their turns are coming a little faster. Why is this? Well, they're essentially taking faster moves in general. Conserve RT doesn't seem particularly sexy, but again, these are basic generics compared with what many consider to be kind of the ultimate endgame class. And while obviously they're not going to be doing terribly well, you know, in a in the context of why am I throwing them under leveled into a endgame dungeon, um, we are noticing that they are taking their actions you know, a decent bit faster. And the reason for this is, again, due to that whole RT thing. Everybody, more or less, has the same idea to try and improve their base damage. But, interestingly, they all do it in different ways. So the Shaman's thing is long range plus uh, nature power, okay? Um, in the case of something like the uh, the Archer, they overcome it by essentially having more... I, I, I kind of consider the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Archer a wizard, but with bows. Their only spell is arrow, uh, but they overcome their low damage with high scaling, um, or essentially multiplication in many cases. Or, for example, in the case of the Warlock, they make up for it by going and combining themselves in with... Hang on, let's go ahead and switch over the class list here. Um, in the case of the Warlock, they overcome it by essentially teaming up with uh, golems and stuff like that and having access to Draconics to attack from longer range. In the case of those basic casters, their approach is essentially, well, what if I just took twice as fast turns? It's not exactly twice as fast, but for the sake of comparison, um, and I bring this up because I have seen those comments come in a lot of, you know, hey, they're shaman, faster RT, how dare you, you dumb. 
let's compare this right here, all right? 96, uh, all of this kind of thing. Roughly speaking, we're looking at 92 to 96 for the loadout that basically all of them are gonna be running. So let's go ahead and load up a basic caster here with whatever the hell happens to be on hand, just for the sake of comparison. Um, again, this is just a basic generic caster. They're not on a special unit. They're not doing anything particularly fancy. Let's go ahead and put those. Actually, you know, let's just make them a full uh, crit build. Why not? Um, probably uh, just go for a staff. I'm not going to bother switching the hands because it's not going to change the weight situation any. Whatever. It's, uh, actually, right. Wrong stick. Do I have any other of the fancy sticks available? Yeah, let's do this one. Uh, and then let's put the uh, the knife in here. Because generally speaking, you want to be running something like a knife because it's going to be lighter on them. And there we go. So, in their particular case, like, we have somebody that's going to be running... I, I, actually, why am I comparing it with her now that I think about it? I've already got these guys already built up over here. Dumb brain is dumb today. But anyway, so, the actual RT difference between them is roughly 3 to 4. So, the reason I bring this up is because usually this is the one that the comments will repeatedly bring up as the big speed advantage, but then also disparage the whole thing of trying to take shorter moves in order to save time. Roughly, um, your actual movement cost per tile that you move is about four to six, give or take. So by taking one or two less tiles, you're essentially doubling the bonus between these two, uh, just to throw this out there. For another one of the comments I saw over, conserve RT does nothing, you know, it's stupid to waste this much time, Again, if we're saying, like, let's say they're using a something like a Tornado 3 over here, this seems like a pretty middle-of-the-road uh, move for them, they're saving 20 RT, which is, again, going to be saving one-fifth of their turn to next time. Their turns are not, like, a, a set pile of turns. It's literally just when the counter goes down, it's their next turn. So, in this case, they essentially could potentially be essentially getting an extra turn every few rounds by doing this. Um, anyway... So, let's get back to the other casters here. Uh, for example, in the case of the Lich, they all doubled down on the Dark Element, just going strictly for neutral, um, and then having the option to pivot into optional, uh, into kind of uh, that advantage from elements through the Apocrypha stuff, through Nature Power. It's kind of niche, but technically they've got the raw power to make it happen. Or something like the Necromancer, which basically does the Warlock thing and then combines themselves with undead units. Or you have the uh, Fusilier who was like, what if wizard but gun? My gun is, or my spell is bullet. And you know what? Funnily enough, the Fusilier, um, compared with many others, is arguably the best wizard DPS in the game. Why is this? Well, there's still going to be a ranged uh, kind of uh, DPS support class. But you know what? Grenades plus uh, two Yamas or whatever the hell uh, is gonna, <laughs> going to do a... Uh, I, or, wait, do they get the Yamas? I or was it just... Uh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, point being, grenades. Um, I forget if the Fusilier gets uh, Yamas or not. I don't think they do, now that I think about it. Actually, no, they totally do, don't they? Anyway, po point being... Do I even have a Yama on this particular one? You get two weapons that uh, uh, that'll give you a uh, weapon bonus. You put it on your uh, on your fusilier. You give them a necklace that boosts their weapon skill. So essentially, like uh, you end up taking this 40 fusil skill and you boost it up to 100. And essentially, you will have guaranteed 700 damage in an AOE versus basically anything that ignores armor. <laughs> at long range off of a lobber, which, granted, doesn't last very long, and this is kind of getting back into that same old argument over, it's like, does a consumable even get to count because you only get four of them kind of a situation? Anyway, point being, they kind of do the archer thing, but in their case, instead of doubling down on the, uh, the weapon doing the extra damage, they essentially will ignore terrain and use those grenades. Um, in the case of the uh, ninja, primarily they may... As, this, as strange as this sounds, while they were a melee powerhouse back in the PSP version, the ninja is more of a caster class this time around. Why is that? Because essentially they're doubling down on using those uh, cheap, lightweight bows to uh, to throw out uh, free debuffs, but then at the same time they have their summons, which aren't very good, but uh, can potentially work very well with the Ogre Blade trick, which I actually never even got into that earlier. Way to go, genius. Um, anyway, so combine it into that, on top of the fact that they actually have a very surprising amount of uh, free caster type of weapons. Uh, this is actually another, another reason that I disparage uh, uh, shamans a bit because they don't have access to so much of this stuff. Like, it, okay, 
When it comes to a caster class, it's not just the stuff that they can equip innately. Like, check this crap out. In terms of the 1HKs, right, most of them aren't going to be doing anything too crazy, you know, actual direct damage-wise. But then look at all of this stuff. They get free spells off of just, like, half their freaking weapon pile over here. It's kind of kind of nuts as far as all that goes. Like, friggin' Deadshot 3, a, uh, what is it, like a 60-something MP spell? They get three of those for free, or they get Firestorms, or they get Ice Blasts, or Aqua Blasts, or Lightning Bows. Um, I don't have the full pile because I didn't care enough, but point being, they get all of that stuff for free with, you know, the debuffs or whatever else. Point being, when it comes to all of these classes, all of them overcome that kind of initial baseline damage thing through having other options. Even the Weesh, as strange as it sounds, is not the same as the Shaman there. How do they overcome it? With By combining in melee. Um, as weird as it sounds, a counter whip Weesh, because of the fact that they're they're running low defense, essentially is going to be taking advantage of that low defense, turning it into offense, instead of just, you know, firing at long range. Because again, the Shaman's whole thing is doubling down on just long range artillery fire, that's it, nothing else, no debuffs, no nothing. Like, you know, Patriarchs Matriarchs, for example. In their particular case, uh, they're going to be uh, going to be kind of putting aside that general idea of like I need to uh, do extra damage and going and doubling down on armor, um, essentially allowing for um, uh, for you know using that hyper armor to keep themselves protected, giving up that nature's power in order to not take damage. Um, so anyway, this can keep going for every caster class in the game. They've all got something going for them, except for the Astromancer. We don't talk about him. But um, anyway, hopefully uh, this helps uh, kind of uh, make the point a little bit here. That as far as the Shaman is concerned, it is, again, the class that specializes entirely on that long-range artillery fire. Due to the fact that they are unique... Uh, they end up losing access to a lot of the stuff that generics will have access to. So, for example, especially a Lich uh, would be able to take advantage of something like the uh, the Ogre Blade uh, to essentially double their intelligence score. Like, you can keep, you know, force-feeding uh, somebody charms for ages, or you can just give them a three, like, free 300 intelligence if they're a generic unit. Or you can turn them into a zombie and make them, like, you can literally just re-raise them as a Lich. Like, double up on their intelligence make them, uh, like, switch them over into something like a Valkyrie, make them undead, and now they cannot die. They'll just keep coming back to life. They'll use those summons for free. They'll take advantage of those insane stats to do insane numbers, combine it in with a luck build, which they can now make up for due to the fact that they're, you know, essentially going to be running around uh, uh, more or less uh, kind of as a weird decaying stripper, like, cannon. Um, <laughs> and... Like, they die, they come back to life, they still cast for free, like, do all this other stuff. Point is, there's so many other options available for that particular thing. So, shamans work well as an as a great, like, entry level, like, here's how, you know, how you can make a caster. They'll do damage from afar. If that's all you need, that's all you need. But, there's a whole lot of other things that a lot of other casters could be doing, uh, you know, faster, better, worse, what, what have you. Um... Just kind of something I wanted to throw out there for context, because oftentimes uh, a lot of folks ended up unlocking the shaman at the same time as they unlocked summons, and that kind of just combined in the head of like, this is the one that does all of the DPS and everybody else does nothing and they're flimsy little peons over here, and then like, none of the other stuff gets tried, and then if we're comparing, you know, the unit that you've dumped all of your stats and charms and time and love into with this like random generic nobody that you picked out of the dirt that baseline is going to, or that comparison is going to look very skewed because suddenly it's like, you know, here's this amazing thing over here. Here's this nobody over here. And one of them is going to look better than the other because one has actually been raised up. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a class that does exactly what they say, uh, which is to hit stuff hard from afar. Uh, go ahead and give them lots of, uh, lots of crits. Go ahead and, uh, give them lots of, uh, uh summons and things. Uh, if you're running them on auto, don't forget to give them a flying item. Um, basically, they, again, are very flimsy, so if you're running them on auto, generally you want to give them a flying item because they don't have access to Steadfast. Uh, <clears throat> Valkyries totally do. Anyway, um, anyway, so yeah, generally you don't really want to run them on AI that often, uh, to be blunt, uh, unless it's a completely flat map and they've got a lot of support with them. Um, Personally, I feel like they're a bit more of a novelty. It's 
like again it's in terms of options they're kind of limited um in terms of uh yuria and deneb in particular don't forget to switch their elements beforehand uh for a decent bit there i thought yuria was actually locked into divine because i had her as a uh, divine songstress before this um which uh yeah that's uh that i I totally forgot to mention this. It, they don't get access to light or dark. So if you happen to make them into divine, you get the most worthless shaman you can possibly get. Because <laughs> all that they can effectively cast is starfall. Which is, it's not a bad ability. It's just, you basically just make the suckiest version you could possibly make of that. But then also, I guess you kind of double down on these ones. Especially due to the fact that uh, Yuri is a you know, kind of generally pretty good uh, melee fighter when you get her. Um, any dang ways. Any dang ways. Uh, hopefully this, uh, you know, this helped to explain the class a little bit, what they do, what they don't do, and, uh, yeah, that'll be, uh, that'll be about that. So, you all have a fantastic one. Don't forget to put, uh, to put some luck on your shamans. Uh, again, natural luck is gonna be a hell of a thing if they happen to get those good rolls early on. Don't forget to potentially swap them out for something that might give them a little bit more, uh, play in terms of their equipment. Um... And, uh, and yeah, that'll be, uh, that'll be about that. Um, actually, one funny note, just to bring this up, uh, one of the, one of the things that, uh, you could really get a lot of, uh, use out of back in the PSP version, uh, was taking the, uh, the Grimoire here, and combining it in with, uh, well, with the fact that it gave them, uh, gave them extra abilities and extra debuffs, or, sorry, extra protection and stuff like that. Funny part this time around is that you can actually kind of sort of do the Weesh thing by giving them a counterattack through this book, especially if you get it uh, stacked up really good through relics. It's a it's a very difficult thing to do, um, but it is arguably one of their better kind of overall DPS options, especially considering that you could do that on all of them, which might somewhat mitigate uh, their whole squishy non-defense existing thing. Um, but one thing that's particularly funny on this is that it also causes them to apparently give up their uh, casting bonuses. So they gain their uh, plus five range because every other book has identical stats except for the racial difference that it gives you. But in the case of the Grimoire, apparently you still do not get the uh, damage bonus uh, for spells uh, when you're going and using a two-handed casting tool. Um, and apparently, uh, as of this morning, according to uh, Twitter, apparently you can't uh, that can't actually be fixed. <laughs> So, um, yeah, uh, that, that's certainly a thing. Um, so yeah, I, apparently, I, as I understand it, it's possible that the whole Dark Knight weapon thing was, uh, them trying to fix some other stuff and then something else completely broke. And, uh, yeah, the, there was actually one of the few direct messages from Mitsuno about that of like, it looks like it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, so either way, so. Uh, hopefully this helped to contextualize these guys a little bit. Um, and yeah, I will see you guys next time uh, when we do the basic casters. Cover more of their speedy casty type of stuff. Alright, take care. Later.